welcome back to the channel. Today I thought we might do something just a little bit different. While we look at a game that's been fairly popular in the retro community, Batman for the NES. Now, Batman was published by Sunsoft in 1989 and is a side-scrolling platformer that was released in conjunction with the summer blockbuster from Batman. This was a huge movie at the time that took many people by surprise. Not only did see Batman come to life in such a faithful way, but how well and natural both Jack Nicholson playing the Joker and Michael Keaton playing Batman worked on the screen, not only individually, but together. This, combined with the art direction of Tim Burton, gave us an image of Batman that took many of us, including me, by surprise. So it should come as no surprise that there would be a movie tying games to go along with it. What was surprising, however, is just how good these games were. Ironically, one of the best titles that would come out of the bunch would be one of the ones that was the least faithful to the movie, Batman for the NES. Now, this saw you playing as the Gate Crusader through five stages of tough-as-nails platforming and action-heavy combat, where you'd have to not only be patient, but pick the right weapon for the situation. Get those wonderful toys. However, before I get too deep into this, let me explain how I want to approach this video. I'd like to take this as an opportunity not only to showcase the game, but hold this game up as an example of most of the things that we've covered in the Game Mechanics series. This game should easily be able to show off three of the four videos, those being light bars, jumping, and movement. You could argue that power-ups are in the game, but given how you don't have to swap one for another, as in pick one up and have another one drop, and the main ones you do pick up are health replenishment and ammo replenishment, I don't really feel it's a good candidate for that particular subject matter. So, with all that said, let's get started. The first thing you'll notice when you start the game is that you're treated to a cutscene of the Batmobile making its way to Gotham and Batman hopping out of the vehicle. In this day and age, cutscenes like this are kind of the norm, but for the NES, this was still pretty advanced. Not long after that, you're introduced to the first stage, Gotham City, and I have to say, this is a very pretty stage. Much of the NES color palette is represented very well, from the jump. And on top of that, you have this incredible mini track that fills you with a deep sense of urgency from the onset. Just listen! Fantastic! It's a great track! Now that we've actually already hit our first guy, let's go ahead and take some time to move around a little bit and figure out what all we can do with our character. He moves fairly fast side to side. When he jumps, he can land onto and launch off of a wall. That tells me two things. First off, the developer wants a faster paced action game, and also, there's going to be some serious jumping shenanigans going on. To build on that, you'll notice that if you lightly press the jump button, you get a light jump. If you press it normally, you get a mid jump, and if you forcefully press it while pressing forward, you get a large launch. This means you're going to have a lot of various different types of jumps and a lot of jump control. Also, look closely at this jump. It has far more animation than normal, which makes it slower. This means we're going to have to pay close attention to when we do jump, so that we make sure we execute it properly. Yeah, this is going to have a lot of platforming, so buckle in. I love how they designed the stage here. It's simple, and yet keys you into a few things right off. Some of the enemies you can hit standing up, and others are easier to hit while you crouch. This is a clever way of the developer teaching you that you can attack while crouching, without going through anything as lengthy as a tutorial. There's no major platforming here, so it looks like they simply just want to use the stage to get you familiar with the base of the combat in the game. By the way, that guy with the flamethrower? That's supposed to be Heatwave. And those guys running at you? That's Shakedown. Both of these were from Batman's Rogue Gallery. Oh, here's another guy. The one shooting at you? Yeah, that's Deadshot. It looks like Sunsoft really wanted to represent the comics with this game pretty well. Okay, we're on to stage 1-2, and things have gotten a little bit more complicated and they've introduced a new enemy type. This one's a little bit harder to deal with. Most of your weapons won't affect it, and it will chase you down and explode. It looks like they want you to learn to jump with this enemy, so if you watch the timing close, it'll make an animation and rush at you, giving you time to jump and avoid taking damage. They also start adding verticality to the levels here. This gives you multiple paths in some cases, and it's also interesting because it touches on something we haven't covered yet, progressive stage design. The way they laid this out, they're teaching you gameplay mechanics without tutorials. They do this by giving you practical situations in which you'll have to organically learn them. This does a few things. It lets the player feel smart, figuring them out, and lets the developer gradually push the player in challenging ways. This is a pretty unpopular way of explaining mechanics today outside of things like the Soul series, but in NES days, it was fairly common, 
and Sunsoft, as you can see, was one of the best at doing it. Let's go ahead and keep pushing. Now, as we push up through the stage, we're going to run into this flying guy. It's kind of hard to hit with your fist, so we're going to switch using the start button to go to Batman's trusty boomerang. This keys you into your resource management. Batman has limited ammunition, which went out and resulted in him being just down to his fist, which is labeled as Batman, which honestly, I kind of love that they called it that. It makes me giggle. In this case, we throw one boomerang and this guy's done. It may take two. Sometimes you don't get multiple hits with it. You may also notice that you have multiple other weapons, some with longer range, some split into multiple projectiles. In this way, they not only make you think about which one to use, they also come with increasing cost to you as far as ammunition goes, making you look over the situation carefully as you approach it, just like, you know, Batman. Huh. I guess they really did fit power-ups into, into this. How about that? Now, we're nearing the end of the stage, and you'll notice that this guy is leaning on the wall. This is what we refer to as a noob trap. He's supposed to represent KG Beast. He's had a bit of a makeover, and this guy hits, and hits hard. So when you do it with him fast, you either need to stun him with your fist or batterings. You can also use my favorite, the spear gun, to kill him and run a lot less risk of getting too close. This is up too much, and you're going to be doing this stage again, so stay on your toes. While we're moving along, let's take note of a couple of other things. Note the health bar. This wasn't super common in most NES games at the time, and it's part of what let them make this game much harder. Given you don't die instantly, they can add more complex situations and enemies without leading to too much player frustration. Enemies also drop hearts and can be respawned, giving you relatively safe places to farm for life if you're low on health, but which makes a very difficult game far more approachable. Also take note of the fact that Batman's purple. They kind of took this for two reasons. One, the NES's base palette was black, so they wanted him to be more distinguishable from the background, and they also wanted him to look a little bit more like the comics, which had a little bit more purple hue. That kind of reinforces the fact that they were going for a more comic book game rather than a movie game when they originally came up with the concept. All right, another thing we haven't talked about yet, boss battles. NES era boss battles were almost always hard and at the end of pretty much every stage. They would usually test you with a few mechanics, and in this one they want to test you with two things, placement and weapon selection. Beat Mothman. He's kind of a pain the first few times you run into him until you learn where to stand and what to use. If you stand in the right spot, you can mostly avoid all his damage, save for his charge. This is essentially known as a safe spot in old school gaming. Not all bosses have one, but some of the NES games make great use of them for teaching positioning, which is key here. We intend to use this against him by pelting him with batterings as he comes in. Learn the timing and stick to it, you'll knock this guy out in no time. Alright, we finished him off and we got another killer cutscene showing all those awesome guns from the movie. Now we're on to Axis Chemicals. This is where the game starts to ramp things up a bit. The platforming gets tighter and the enemy placement gets trickier. Also, look at how pretty this stage is for an epic game. On top of that, once again, there's this killer track going on in the background. Notice the platforming as you go through the stage. Yet again, Sunsoft developers are taking the time to teach you each jump spacing just by the way they set up the platforms. They're also forcing you to make critical decisions with enemy placement. Look how narrow the platform is. You can either use a weapon out of your arsenal or you can try to do a pixel perfect jump saving you some ammo. What you do depends on how good you are and how much ammo you have to spare. Very, very clever. They also take the time to teach you how to do a drop jump here, which is a very tricky but necessary mechanic in the game. Now, Sunsauce developers decide to gradually push that platforming skill up just a little bit more. They already taught you jump spacing, enemy placement. Now, let's make things more narrow and more dangerous. 
Stage 2 too looks easy enough when you start, but your jumping skills are going to be tested here. It's a good thing that there are a few spots that you can stuff the farm health on because it's going to hurt. Speaking of health, while we're making our way through the stage, just think of how tricky the learning curve would be on this game if you could only take a single hit. With the precision required to make many of the jumps, I'd argue that this game would already be nearly insurmountable for most players. And we're just digging into stage two. Notice, as I make my way through the stage, how shallow some of these stages seem to make you want to jump, and how they more and more reinforce the utilization of all the movement abilities that they've given you, pushing you to figure out how to navigate these tightly designed stages. Once you master the labyrinth of jumps that's in stage 2-2, it's time to push on. Just one more stage before the boss. Stage 2-3 doesn't bring much outside of moving platforms. This does force us, however, to learn a little bit more about timing on the jumps, and it does have some clever enemy placement that can be devious, but push through and you'll reach the boss. This boss is an interesting one. I kind of want to call him Hardak, and he's actually called like the, the Ace Chemicals AI thingy. I don't know, he's, he's a mechanical boss. Uh, the first stage of this is pretty simple. You can just literally push through it, dodging the bullets. You're going to eat some damage, but with a little bit of practice, you're going to have some life when you're done here. The next part is the upper left. You're going to have to use some precise jumping to get to the right spot and not get hit so that you can take your shots at this thing. Once it's hit nine times, it's time to drop down because the heart of the unit will start firing at you. This is the trickiest part because it requires good timing and a few precision jumps in order to get in and on top of the unit itself. If you do it right, you won't need to use any ammo to finish this thing, which is good because you're going to need it going into stage three. Notice how every time I jump in on the last phase of this boss, I'm having to do a strong jump, then a shallow jump to wall jump off with a stronger jump to hit the boss. Sunsoft takes almost every opportunity they can to kind of reinforce these jump mechanics since they're such a core part of the gameplay. They want you to practice these as much as they can as they continue to ramp up the difficulty. It turns out that as soon as you took out access chemicals, it triggered a trap, trapping you into the sewers because, well, it's an NES game and an early game. Pretty much every game in the series needed a sewer level. It was like literally written into the game design bylaws, I think. If you thought the game was actually hard before though, yeah, get ready because this is where things ramp up. Uh, the enemies get tougher and the platforming gets a bit more serious. The most difficult enemy you're gonna run into now is called the Jader and it looks a lot like Killer Croc. Matter of fact, I'm just going to call it Killer Croc. It will hop up and down and chase you pretty much relentlessly and does a significant amount of damage. You have to approach these carefully and mind your spacing in order to get through these stages. I recommend using the spear gun, that way you don't have to get too close. Other than that, there isn't a whole lot new to learn here. It's a well-designed stage with some solid platforming and a good overall challenge. Section 3-2 is going to have the same thing, only with more verticality going downwards and some more careful jumping so that you don't land into things like turbines and the like. Once you push through these two, you're going to come out to some caverns. This is stage 3-3. This stage presents you with one of the harder jumping challenges in the game, but first you're going to have to get through some new enemies. And by the end of the stage, I may end up having to grind for some health, so you may sit there and watch me grind health and ammunition for a little bit before I make these series of jumps, because it's very easy to take damage, because there's turbines on your way up. So not only can you take damage on the way up and stun yourself and fall back down, there's also enemies on the way up. You'll see as we get there. It's it's kind of a tricky section, but it's a good challenge. So now we're looking directly at the jump sequence that we're going to have to do to get up to the boss. This is really tight and one of the first major tests of your platforming skill and the wall jumping technique in order to get to the top and push through to the executioner, who's another person from Batman's Road Gallery. This guy himself is pretty simple. Once you get to him, you can just spam batarangs if you have good amount of health. But let's get there first. 
You'll notice as we climb up, there's like these turbines. The positioning of your jump is pretty particular, and you have to make sure that you jump just right. You're going to have to make good use of all the different strengths of jumps that you have in order to get up to the top. Once you get to the top, you're going to have another one of those tank things you ran into that you're going to have to deal with before you walk into this boss. Hopefully you have a couple extra lives or you're near full health and you've done a good job of climbing up here by the time you get here. Because the best way to deal with him, like I said before, is just spam batarangs and let him jump around you. Eventually he'll drop and you'll still have like three or four life left. It's not that big of a deal. So let's go ahead and finish him up and then we'll wrap this up and we'll come back whenever I can actually accomplish both stage four and five. So there you have it guys. That was my first episode of what I'm tentatively calling applied game mechanics, where we kind of look at a game and try to glean what mechanics, what techniques they used, what they're showing us, and what they're presenting to us in the game and how they build on that throughout the game. Was that interesting for you guys? Did you enjoy it? Would you like to see more of it? Would you like to see this one finished or do you think we gleaned everything we can from this particular game and need to move on to another game? Let me know in the comments. Give me a thumbs up if you liked the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, happy gaming.